I got on a colt. It was probably 10 rides or something. And, you know, you kind of start off in the round pen or snubbed up to something, you know, another horse or, you know, and you start off in the round pen and then you kind of go to a little bigger pen and then, and then you venture outside. Well, I had had a couple of rides on this colt outside and I thought, you know what? I, I, ju I just want a long trot. Well, the place that I was keeping these horses and everything, there was only about, about 40 acres. And I'm not saying that you can't long trot in a big old circle, but I mean, I wanted to line out and just go. So it was on this little farm to market road. And so I, I go down and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out in this gate. And so what I did is, is I get out there and I, and I get off the horse. And I don't know about y'all, but if you've ever worked with horses or anything, I don't mind really climbing on any horse. Climbing on a horse is easy because no matter where you're at in that process, if it gets too hairy or too squirrely, you can just kind of push off and get off. But I've always been a lot more hesitant and nervous stepping off a horse because I mean you're already up there you go to step off there's about a hundred different things that go wrong and when they go wrong it very rarely you know you, you don't ever hear the story yeah I was getting off and he blew up and everything was just fine no that's when the wrecks happen you go over the other side I mean it's happened so I get up there and I kind of get shut down and I go to step off that horse you know he kind of boogers a little bit because you know there's cars driving by and stuff and th this is a first for this cult so i'm trying to be pretty gentle with him and so it, it's just a, it's a wire gate so i get over there and 62 minutes later i'm still struggling with it because you know i, I don't know who builds wire gates that you need a you know you needed a winch to get open and it was at that point right now that my wife would say don't you call me that but that's just a joke we have. So anyway, I, oh, I get the wire gate open and I, and I throw it back and I try to get the horse through. And, you know, he's got a he's got a snaffle bit in his mouth and I'm like, come on. And he just stands there. He's like, uh, -uh it ain't happening. Come on, boy. Come on. And so I try that old deal, you know, put a little bit of pressure on and eventually he'll give to the pressure. Except he wasn't giving to the pressure and I was running out of patience because I'd already spent 62 minutes trying to get the gate open. And I'm like, and, and, and nothing's working. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to say this. I, I really am. I, I, I'm not proud of this. But I start losing my temper. You know, I, I need to get out there. We're going to long trot for an hour or, or more and we're wasting time. And so I start, you know. And, and the more forceful I get, the more he just goes to backing up. So I kind of go back through the gate. I dip him around in some circles, and now I'm lathering him up. I'm getting lathered up, and I try to get him through there, and he won't do it. And I'm still pulling on him, and now I've got both reins, not just one. And I'm, you sorry son of a gun. And so I'm kind of jerking on him now, and finally he comes through. And when he comes through, me being a dummy, I'm standing right in the middle of the gate, pulling him right towards me. So finally, I think of him as saying, all right, you've been standing in the gate and I would have gone through the gate if you'd have got out of the way, but I'm going to come through that gate. And his head hits me right here and just lays me flat out on the ground. He runs over me. I've still got a hold of the reins. And I mean, I kind of use his momentum when he runs over the top of me. I jerk him around and I come up. And I did the dumbest thing any human has ever done in their life. And we're not talking about the stupid moralness of this situation. But I balled up my fist and I hit that horse in the face. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you have never really been around a horse, but I can take you right down there and introduce you to a horse's face. It's just solid rock most of it unless you can hit that little cheek piece but it's just rock with about this much padding on it and i hit him right between the eyes which is just stupid i might as well go and pound on this steel over here and i hit that and it don't hurt him you can't hit a horse i don't care what you've seen on blazing saddles you can't hurt a horse okay and so i hit this horse and broke my hand well, now this horse says, you know what? I've been really patient with you letting that little, little leather thong attach us, and I'm not going to have it anymore. And so he started our long trot without me. There he went, right down that long lease between the two fences. Just, whew, there he goes. And I'm left standing there. I'm filthy all the way back from getting run over. 
my hand is swelling up like this and I no longer have a horse, but yet I sure do look the part. I've got my spurs on, I've got my, my shaps on, and here I am walking to my horse that I can't even see anymore. People are passing by and I thought, you know what, this is about as humiliating as it can be. You know, I, and, and while I was walking, I kept thinking, is this really, would somebody, would some kid in the car say, look, mom, that guy don't have no horse, but he's walking down the bar ditch in his, in his chaps and his, in his spurs. That's what I want to be when I grow up. No, I look like an idiot walking down this deal, chasing a horse. It was my fault that we had got in a wreck. You know, Jesus said that we were the light of the world. But the light that most professed followers of Christ shine is either fabricated or non-existent. And, and what, I, what I mean by this is I'm saying people ought to look at us as Christians, as professed believers in Jesus Christ, saved Christians. They ought to look at us and go, I want what you have. But I don't think that they do because a, a, lot of, a lot of people that don't go to church, and I'm not saying that going to church makes you a Christian. It doesn't. But people that don't have an active relationship with God, it's because they have been around some people that claim to be a follower of God, but they acted nothing like the man that they said that they, that they follow. Our, Jesus said, let your light shine. It is that light that, sh it is his light that shines through us that is going to attract people to him. Unfortunately, I think as Christians, sometimes, you know, we, we've, we've dug so far into the Bible that we missed the big main point as Christians. Okay, that I heard a story one time that, that a guy went to the to the uh, to the the eye doctor, and he said, "Okay, cover up your right eye and read the top line." Now we all know what that is, right? We all know what it is. And that guy kind of smiled, and he read the copyright information along the bottom, and it was in about this big of letters. And the doctor said, "Well, that was mighty fine work there, cowboy." Too bad you failed the test. And I think that that's what we have done by, by digging so deep into the Bible. You know, I, it just makes me crazy. I'm not criticizing. It just makes me crazy because I hear people say, oh, you know, we, we just like to dig into that Bible and dig and dig. Well, that, that's fine. But, you know, let, let's not miss the main point. Let's not fail the test because God says, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to love others. Yeah, but you know what? Man, if they're engaging in sin, we're supposed to go tell them. We're supposed to do this and we're supposed to do that. And maybe there's a time and place for it like Ty was saying. You know, maybe that if we do see a brother or sister that's doing something that may uh, harm their relationship with Christ and it hurts us to see them struggling with that, sure, maybe we go do that. But Christianity has, and it's not authentic, it's a fake Christianity, it's a pharisaical, that's a nice, spell that Ty. PH, that's all he got to, PH. Uh, it, it, it's like the Pharisees, you know, they just, they just want to make rules and, and point at people that aren't following the right rules. I don't think that's necessarily what God intended us to do. Unfortunately, I think that, that, that religion, and I'm not talking about the true church. I'm not talking about the church that Jesus built, that Jesus is the head of. I'm talking about religion. I, I think that they've tried to jerk people through that narrow gate. They stand right in the middle of the gate and just jerk on people trying to force them through with these rules and, and, and stuff like that. Religion wants to be a bit in people's mouth and drag them wherever they want them to go. I mean, you, you look at it. I mean, just different denominations. Think about this. You know, you, you've got this denomination over here that says this, and then you've got this denomination that says that. And they're all supposedly reading the same book. And if they would just look at the top line of that book, it just says, love God and love others. And I'm not saying that the rest of those small print, that, that that's not in there. It is. But we don't need to be going around and jerking, trying to jerk people through that narrow gate. When someone does something wrong, religion jerks on their mouths and make them pay attention. You know, boy, they, Christians are good about that. Especially in light of 
you know, Supreme Court rulings, and, and, and I'm not, we're not getting into that whole debate. You can think whatever you want to, but what happened to God saying love? Okay? What happened to all of the big letter stuff? You know, we, religion tries to jerk people through the narrow gate, tries to force people into something that they believe in, where they think that somebody should go. The other thing is, religion butt heads about everything with everyone. You know, it just absolutely amazes me that it doesn't matter where I go, where I speak, what I do, and, and you may have experienced some of the same thing. What happens is somebody will say something about God, and you can always find a religious person because they're going to they're gonna correct you. They're going to say, well, and they're going to try to correct you. Good grief, man. Religion wants to butt heads with everything. Everyone. They want to start arguments. They want to debate everything. They want to say, here's my opinion. This is what I think. And unfortunately, God's light doesn't shine through that very well at all. They like to point out Religion likes to point out the sins of unbelievers and believers alike. Religion is very sin-focused. Religion also likes to correct believers on everything. And, 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 and religion makes people want to share their faith by criticizing others. It doesn't work like that. And you know what? The other thing that religion does is religion makes us end up walking a road that no one wants to be on. You know what I mean? We wonder why, you know, the, our, our, and I don't care, e even the mega churches. People criticize mega churches. You'll never hear me criticize anybody that's trying to spread the word of God. And I know some of you are like, well, they do this, this, this. I don't care. God's bigger than all of that. I don't care. But there's a bunch of people just right here in this little small town or, or small town where, where y'all are watching on the internet and stuff. There's people that don't know Christ. And unfortunately, they have seen people walking down a road that, that they really don't want to be on. The light that we, that, that we are shining as Christians today is, is a dim light, to say the least. Um, has anybody ever seen Finding Nemo? Okay, that, that, that's like, Finding Nemo is like right underneath Lonesome Dove. It's like between Lonesome Dove and Tombstone, okay? If you don't like Finding Nemo, we need to baptize you today, okay? Something's wrong. Well, there's this part in Finding Nemo where the, the guy that steals Nemo, his, his mask falls off or something like that, and his address is written on the mask, and the mask falls into the black abyss. Well, uh, was it Drory or something like that? Dory. Dory. Yeah, Dory. Uh, she's my Ellen. I just call her Ellen because that's who it is. Ellen, you know, they, they, they swim down to get it, and, and they're swimming, and they're swimming, and they're like, I see a light. And so they swim over there and like, they're looking at it and they're like, oh, it's so beautiful. And the light kind of starts moving and they start following it. And all of a sudden the light comes up and there's these big old teeth and it's one of them big old deep sea monsters that attracts people with light. Unfortunately, I think that that's what religion is like. They dangle a light out there in front of people, but, it's a, but there's some teeth behind it. Now... <laughs> I, I, and me and Ty have had this conversation as he gets into ministry more and more and more. He's like, man, them wolves don't bite near as hard as those sheep do. And it's true, man. A sheep, a follower of Christ that gets on you and, and starts attacking you with Scripture. And man, it happened the other day on Facebook. Man, these people said that I'm, oh, good grief. It was horrible. I left it up there just as a reminder to ignore people like that. But, it, you know, they, they dangle a light, and, and it's not the light of Christ. It, it's, a, it's another false light with teeth behind it. Is that not what most people see the church as? And that's unfortunate because you and I both know, if you're sitting here today, I hope you know that that's not the truth. That there shouldn't be any teeth behind the light that we're supposed to be shining. There's a story about a boy who was watching a horseman work with a new colt. The man was known for his abilities with horses, so the boy had come to learn what he could. He watched for a long time as the man worked his trade. Finally, the cowboy walked over to the boy and asked if he needed something. The boy said he wanted to learn the secret of horsemanship. The cowboy reached into his pocket and grabbed something and 
took it out and held his fist out to the boy and said if the boy could open up his fist, then he would find the secret to great horsemanship in his hand. I'm going to finish that story in just a minute. Wouldn't it be great if people actually wanted what we had? If it was like that boy that comes up and sees us living a Christian life and says, I want what you have. I will stay here as long as it takes so I can discover the secret of what you have. What if people saw your life and wanted what you had? And I'm not talking about your nice trucks. I'm not talking about your camper trailers or your, your living quartered horse trailers or your, you know, whatever. I'm talking about if they came up and said, I want to be like you. I don't care what you have. I don't care what your bank account looks like or, or what your wife looks like or what your husband looks like or how much acreage you have or how much cattle or how many horses. I want what you have. Wouldn't it be great if they saw your life and wanted that? Wouldn't it be great if what you if you possessed an air about you that spoke of trust, love, strength, and kindness? Man, wouldn't that be awesome if somebody said, man, I just, I just want to be like, you know, I want to be like Ty. I want to be like Nick. I want to be like, you know, all of you. I want to be like them because, man, inside of them, they exhibit this, this trust, this love, this strength, this wisdom, this kindness. What if people sought you out for wisdom and they wanted to ride next to you in the gathering? Man, I, you know, I, I want to do anything I can to get close to that guy so I can just I can maybe pick something up from him of how to live an awesome life like he's living. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next about four to five weeks is how to have an awesome life. In other words, how to be awesome. Now, you have to understand what I mean by this. I'm not saying that I'm going to teach you how to be awesome so that we can be arrogant so people can say, look at me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having God's light shine brightly through us, the real kind of light, so that others will be attracted to what we, who we are and what we have living inside of us. But here, here, here's, a, here's a deal right here. I, I, I want you to understand, okay? And this is going to be kind of hard for some of you. Your beliefs do not make you awesome. Okay? Just because you believe in God does absolutely nothing. Okay? The Bible says even the demons believe in God and they shudder. Okay? And, and, and Jesus even says, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that and didn't we do this? Your beliefs don't do anything. Okay, they may be a foundation for something, but light doesn't shine through you. Jesus' light does not shine through you because you believe something. But here's the trick. Your beliefs don't make you awesome, but your behavior does. So you can believe, we, I, I can believe anything I want, but, but belief means nothing. People don't see what I believe. People see what I do. People see how I act. People see my interaction with others. They see how you act. They see how you speak. They see how, how you do things. There, there, there was a time not too long ago that I was, I was out branding and I kind of told, I told this story. But, you know, y'all hear me get up and tell these wild cowboy stories. You hear Ty talk about these wild horse wreck stories and, and, and things that we've been through. But... 90% of you have probably never seen me on a horse. You hear a lot of stories. You hear a lot of stories. Well, I was at a Brandon one time and got in a wreck, and Fiona kind of got rim-fired, and she started pitching, and I just sat up there, still dallied, and we nearly knocked over everything and everybody, but I never, I, I just tried to remain calm. I'm not saying what wasn't going on on the inside, but whenever it got rough, whenever things got tense, I tried to stay relaxed, and I just stayed dallied to that big old heifer that I was trying to drag, and everything happened. Just It turned out just fine. And afterwards, my buddy comes up to me, and he says, man, that was cowboy right there. That was cowboy. I love that. 
You hung right in there. You did everything you're supposed to do, man. I loved what you did. Well, the people are watching each and every one of us as, as Christ followers. They don't care what you say you believe in. They don't care how many Bible studies you go to. They don't care how much scripture that you can memorize and quote. And they don't care how many you know, programs on TV that you watch. What they want to see is how do you handle yourself in a tense situation? And unfortunately, a lot of us fail. We don't let God's awesomeness shine through. It's not our awesomeness. It's God's awesomeness. There, there's, a, there's a film on our lives that God's light is bright, but sometimes our behavior is like a set of shutters. It just closes that light in. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, Paul talks about tense situations. And he gives us five things that we can work on in order to be awesome so that we can avoid those wrecks, so that our behavior magnifies God's light that lives in us, not shutters it off. Again, I say, <laughs> if he says, again, I say, he's already said this once, okay? Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Now, I'm not much of a Bible scholar, people, okay? I'm not. But let me ask you a question. If you're one of these people, or you know somebody that is one of these people say, man, I just don't understand the Bible. If you don't understand this, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. If you cannot fathom what that means, come talk to me. I've got a hot shot that may help you. Okay, there, there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect somewhere and we're going to try to reconnect you. Again, I say don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fight. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. <laughs> a servant of the Lord must not quarrel but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. If you're not thinking that the Bible is hard to do, <laughs> you're not listening to this because Paul is stepping on every one of our toes right here. Again, I say don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. We could work on that one scripture the rest of our lives and probably uh, not get to where we need to be. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to work on it. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Okay? Five steps to awesomeness. And what I mean by awesomeness is five steps to allow God's light to shine through us. Okay? Number one, don't get in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Man, that is so easy to do. Just walk away. It's not going to do anything. And, and, I, and, and there's a bunch of reasons of why we allow ourselves to get into these stupid, stupid arguments. Number one is pride. Number two is pride. <laughs> Number three is probably pride. Or, you know, we get offended by everything. Today, you know, I, I think that today's society is, let's see what I can get offended by today. You know, and, and Ty talked a little bit about that. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that somebody else did something wrong. I have people come up to me all the time and say, well, I need to talk to you about this. Just because you need to talk to me about it doesn't mean that I did anything wrong. And vice versa. Don't get in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Do you know what your life would be like if you no longer argued? I'm not saying that you need to suddenly become a wimp. I'm just saying, do you know how much better your life would be if you just said, I'm not going to argue with you? Five steps to awesomeness. The first one, don't get in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Number two, be kind to everyone. Now, like I said, that does not mean, do not mistake, you need to be kind to everyone. That does not mean you need to be a big old sissy pushover. That is not what that means at all. It just means treat people with kindness. And, and a lot of people, um, you know, I saw this, I saw a saying the other day, you know, 
By gosh, people are lucky that I don't do to them as they do to me. See, Jesus, there was a golden rule that used to be in all the classrooms. Now, and I was older before I even realized it was scripture. Do unto others as they would have them, as you would have them do unto you. But that doesn't mean that just because somebody's rude to you that you get the opportunity that they open the gate and that you get to act however you want to act. That's not what it means. It means be kind to everyone. Give them what they don't deserve. If somebody's chewing on you or criticizing you, and I know it's hard because, you know, I think me and Ty, you know, we kind of talking about the same thing this week because we both went through the exact same thing. And I told George Cisneros, our missionary in Guatemala, I told him this morning, I said, man, I've had a really rough week. I wish God had just let me teach something that I'm already good at instead of making me go through the lesson and then teach it. He just said, man, I get you. Be kind to everyone. That doesn't mean that you're a jellyfish just going around, yes sir, yes sir, yes. That's not what I'm talking about. But you can still hold tight to your beliefs, what you believe in, your character, your morals, without arguing with everybody. Don't argue. Be kind to everyone. Be able to teach. Now what able to teach means is you better know your stuff and you better know it correctly. And I'm not talking about being able to read the fine print. If you can't read the top line, the big E, the big G, you don't know what you're talking about. But you must be able to teach. If you want to be awesome, number one, you quit arguing stupid foolish arguments about everything you know people just have their opinion and I the thing that I absolutely hate is when people say well I have the right to to say whatever I want well you have the right to say whatever you want but you have to earn the right to be heard no word does, the, does, the, does that amendment does that right say people must sit there and listen to your foolishness no that's not what it says or Kevin's foolishness we can say whatever we want to, but we have to earn the right to be heard. You have to avoid arguments, be kind, and be able to teach. In other words, you've got to know what you're talking about. That's number three. Number four, be patient with knotheads. Now, I know that many of you don't know any knotheads. I'd like for you to come hang out with me for a week, and I'll show you a bunch of them. Okay? Be patient with knotheads. It, it, it's kind of like that situation with the roping, okay? It's the knotheads that are going to teach us how to avoid arguments, be kind, be able to teach, to be patient, or, you know, I, and uh, a friend of mine, Frank Johnson, he calls them uh, EGRs, which stands for Extra Grace Required, okay? We got to give them what they don't deserve because otherwise, you know, if your love cannot be taken advantage of, you're not really loving. Okay? And, and, and the Bible even says, man, you know, you, you, you say you love people, but you only love the people that, that think like you, talk like you, act like you, that believe the same things you do, that are the same political affiliation, that are the same, uh, you know, go to the same clubs as you do, like the same kind of horses, that, you know, they like the, you know, the cow stuff and not the dressage or they don't like, you know, anybody can be nice to the people that are like them. Jesus said you'll know people by how they deal with all the other knotheads. Five steps to awesomeness of allowing that light to shine through us so that others will be attracted to Christ. Okay? I hope that I'm making that clear, that I'm not trying to say, oh, go to save the cowboy. If you go to save the cowboy, you're awesome. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about removing that veil that our behavior places on things that, that keeps Christ's light from shining out through us. Don't get in foolish, ignorant arguments. Be kind to everyone. That doesn't mean be a sissy. That just means show kindness. It takes more of a man to walk away than it does to fight. Be able to teach. Know your stuff. Be patient with knotheads. And the last, gently instruct. And, and, I, and I think that that's where a lot of the, 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 the religious people and, and, and the Christians, they're like, oh, I'm trying to gently instruct you. No, you're not. You're, you're using that as an excuse to start one of these ignorant arguments. When it says gently instruct, 
those that's people that's open you know if, if there's a conversation you know if if Ty or Mike comes up to me and says hey I've got a question about something when that dialogue that relationship says they say well I think this way and I'm like, well, you know, if you really want to know what the Bible says, here's what the Bible says in this instance about this. Let's look at other instances about it. That's gently instructing. Most people's idea, uh, you know, religion's idea of gently instructing is to manipulate, criticize, and force people to believe what they believe instead of what God says. Five steps to awesomeness. To allow Jesus to shine through your life because your beliefs don't mean anything. Your beliefs don't make you awesome. Your behavior does. People don't see what you believe. They see how you behave. Especially in those situations where you want to argue, where you don't, where you want to be anything but kind, where you, you don't want to teach somebody, you want to set them straight. You want to, you know, fist fight them and jerk them through here, and hit them between the eyes, break your hand. You want to gently instruct them until they believe exactly how you believe. Uh-uh. That's not, that's not being awesome, man. That's being manipulative. That's what the Pharisees did. The Bible says that through these things, God can change people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Think about that. It says it right there in verse 25. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Your behavior, allow, good or bad, good, it allows it to open up. Let God's light shine through there. And God's light is going to reach into the dark places of people's hearts and they are going to come to know Christ through that. It is amazing that God's plan for the world was to entrust His message with us. He started with 12 knotheads of His own. And now it's our job. We are all ministers. We are all commanded to let that light shine through us. And it's our behavior that is the lens through how brightly that light shines. The Bible says that through these things, God can change people's hearts and they will know the truth. Man, that's humbling. It's sobering. It won't happen by jerking on people's mouths because they did something that you don't agree with, and it won't but happen by butting heads with everybody and trying to force feed our beliefs into them. What will happen is when we love these people. Love each other. Quit arguing with other Christians about anything and everything. Man, just love people. Let God's love shine through us. The boy pried and poked and pinched on the cowboy's hand, trying desperately to get to what was inside, but he could not get it open. Finally, the boy gave up and hung his head and said, I can't get your fist open. Why, the cowboy replied. I guess because I'm not strong enough or smart enough. No, the cowboy said. It's because you didn't ask. And he opened his fist. Right there. That's it. Quit trying to ball up our fist and pound our beliefs into the unbelieving world and all of this stuff. Instead, open up a loving hand to each and every person out there and allow share your light because Jesus loves lives in each and every one of us. Share that with others. But you're not going to be able to share it through your beliefs. You're only going to be able to share it through your behavior. Let's go to God in prayer. God, help us to be awesome so that people will want to get to know you. You're the awesomeness that lives in each of us, and we want you to shine brightly in our lives. Help us not to have a closed fist attitude towards people, but an open palm of kindness, ready to show your love that you've shown us. Let us show that same love to others. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.